Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, East Campus to the Middle East, Higher Education, Humanitarian Action, and a Major Misunderstanding. My name is Sarah Speltz, and I'm an Assistant Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered as part of Global Days of Service, a month-long worldwide service effort during which BU alumni, staff, and students volunteer together in their communities around the world. Continuing the global theme, I know we have alumni joining us today from near and far, alumni participating from South Africa, Turkey, Sri Lanka, and U.S. cities like D.C., Philadelphia, Miami Beach, and many alumni here in Massachusetts. For each and every one of you out there, please know we are thrilled to have you all together for this online program. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of the presentation, please contact Adobe Connect at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website found at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you have, and you are welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box you see located below the slides. We hope to get as many questions as we can, get to as many questions as we can during the webinar. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Presenting today from here in Boston is College of General Studies and College of Arts and Sciences, alum Sciences alumnus Matthew Trevithick. Since graduating from BU with a degree in international relations, Matt has worked at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars in Washington, D.C., at Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, and at American University in both Afghanistan and Iraq. He's currently the co-founder and director of research at RSEO Research in Turkey. Uh, I'll let Matt tell more of his story, but before handing things over, I will add that he speaks Farsi, can get by in Russian and Arabic, and has lived and traveled across the Middle East, Central Asia, and Africa, including Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Mali. And just in case all of that didn't keep him busy enough, he's also a medal-winning rower and has coached the Iraqi and Afghan national rowing teams. Matt, thank you again for being with us today, and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's uh, it's great to be here, and uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, talking with everybody um, after um, uh, a few brief remarks here uh, on the front end. Um, so generally, when I talk with folks, there's a bit of uh, curiosity about um, kind of how I've ended up uh, where I've ended up and um, just kind of a few big ideas that um, or like my takeaways from from what I've seen um, uh, out in the world so I'm just going to go through kind of the a few highlights and a few points and end with a, a few observations and thoughts before um, uh, opening up to questions and answers which I always find are uh, far and away the most most interesting part of of anything. Um, like the introduction said, I'm a BU graduate. I uh, graduated in uh, 2008 and was studying international relations and uh, Arabic language uh, here at BU and um, was per particularly, um, I think, fortunate to study uh, under uh, a whole group of great, great professors, but uh, Andrew Basevich specifically, I uh, got to take quite a few classes with him and uh, hearing his take on U.S. foreign policy and American foreign policy uh, as it relates to the world and both um, in, in kind of all realms from World War II forwards uh, had, a, had an impact uh, on my thinking and uh, actually the further I went the further away I went from from BU, um, actually, the the more relevant and powerful some of his ideas um, seemed. So, um, 
Yeah, right after I graduated, <laughs> I was a rower in college. Uh, our rowing coaches were always saying that, uh, I think like most uh, athletic coaches were always saying that, that school really uh, interfered with um, <laughs> our training time and uh, much to the uh, annoyance of my actual professors. Um, but in any event, I graduated on a rowing dock in 2008 because we had a race on the same day as graduation. So the provost of BU dutifully came out to the race instead of us attending graduation. Um, and shortly after taking kind of the last strokes in, in college, uh, found myself in the Middle East uh, for the, in the summer of 2008, uh, landing in Beirut and spending time in Damascus, uh, Amman, and Jerusalem, traveling back and forth. Um, and this was uh, really an opportunity for me to take everything um, that I'd uh, kind of studied in theory uh, from the comfort of uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and try to put it together and piece it together, um, you know, on the ground uh, where things happen. And I always think um, on the ground, being on the ground is, is an absolutely indispensable part of anybody's education. Uh, whatever you're studying, even if you're studying economics, you probably still need to go and see different areas where economic policies play out um, differently. So that was really an incredible uh, summer. <laughs> I took this uh, picture here because when people ask what I saw uh, the most of in Syria, where uh, I traveled and spent spent quite a bit of time, um, it was actually uh, this guy's face everywhere, um, referring to the slide uh, here of President Bashar al-Assad, and. Uh, you know, sort of feeling what it was like to live in a place like that, uh, however briefly, um, also had a, a fairly big uh, impact on my thinking and it, and it, I think nothing takes uh, things faster from kind of theory to practice than to be uh, walking around countries that operate in a radically different style than um, the one you're from does. In, so that was 2008. In just the end of 2008, early 2009, I moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, rowing again uh, opened the door for me there. I got a job as a high school girls <laughs> rowing coach, which uh, paid me just enough to be able to afford to crash on a friend's couch for a few months. Um, and while I was down there, uh, started applying fairly aggressively for uh, internships and, and jobs around D.C. On, on Middle East things and was fortunate enough to end up uh, working as an intern for uh, a Middle East scholar named Robin Wright and helping her uh, draft and put together her uh, book, which went on to win an Overseas Press Club Award for Best Nonfiction Title. And that really taught me a lot about kind of analysis of the Middle East and, and um, how uh, the book was on the Middle East um, and uh, how it comes together from an academic perspective, how research comes together for actually putting a major project uh, like a book together. And at the same time, managed to uh, snag a job at Georgetown Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, which is, um, Georgetown has a very strong uh, Middle East program, and uh, got to kind of start mixing with folks who, who called the Middle East home and were also uh, in Washington, D.C., kind of advancing their cause. And this was an interesting uh, time for me. And both of these avenues led to um, me finally getting back to the Middle East. Uh, as with everywhere, I think it's very easy to visit places in the world, and now more so than ever. Um, you know, when I graduated, Boston didn't have many or any direct flights um, to places other than Europe or maybe Japan. Um, and now we have uh, direct flights to Dubai, to Istanbul, to uh, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, etc. And um, Middle East is a very easy place to visit, contrary to what I think some people would think, but it's hard to get a job. Um, it's hard to know where to look for to actually have gainful employment, uh, to not lose money at least, which was my only bar uh, as a 22-year-old, 21-year-old, 22-year-old kid. Um, and uh, so via the Woodrow Wilson Center and via Georgetown, um, I was fortunate enough to learn about something called the American University of Iraq, which is a startup university in a city called Suleimania or Suleimani, depending on um, Kurdish or Arabic uh, pronunciations, up in the Iraqi Kurdistan uh, region uh, of Iraq up, up north. And this was incredible for me because it was um, finally a, a way to stay grounded in the Middle East, uh, to go and to stay for a significant uh, period of time. And I ended up staying there for just over a year um, before taking a step to, to Afghanistan. Um, but while I was in Iraq, this is when you, know, you kind of really start to, to immerse yourself uh, in a foreign culture. 
uh, working on your language abilities, of course, um, and uh, putting putting to use everything uh, you can there. And really, I, I thought with both this job and my and my work in Afghanistan, I thought I'd landed uh, the best possible job for a, a kid in his 20s uh, who wanted a little bit of adventure and wanted to see the world because at both the American University of Iraq where I was working and later at the American University of Afghanistan where I'd spend four years and I'll talk about in a second, um, I got to mix with and meet with kind of the brain trusts of uh, these countries that were going through such, you know, uh, horrific and um, or tumultuous times uh, one way or the other there was so much going on in these countries so to be able to hang out um, and just spend time with um, uh, students from all across Iraq and talk to them and kind of pick their brains on what they saw happening and um, just kind of seeing how uh, Yes, you can read the news. Yes, you can read the headlines and, and work to follow places as best you can, but to actually engage directly daily for an extended period of time with the folks who call call these countries home uh, really was amazing for me and, and definitely personalized uh, the connection to, to uh, the region. And while I thought I had uh, left rowing uh, for good in the United States, actually it turned out there was an Iraqi rowing team. Uh, I won't go into this at length, um, but uh, long story short, I worked with um, uh, a bunch of great rowing coaches uh, here in Boston uh, along the Charles River, and um, we ended up getting the Iraqi team uh, via some assistance with, from the U.S. State Department for uh, visas and the like uh, here to Boston for a while, actually, to train them and uh, and improve their, their abilities, and then they went on to win uh, Iraq's first ever medal uh, at the Asian Games in 2011, which was uh, really cool to see, actually, in one of those just totally unexpected expected things um, that that always happen uh, every time you you go out into the world and and see so many things that you would never never expect um, so in 2010 I left uh, Iraq towards the end of 2010 and showed up uh, in Afghanistan and while I was in Iraq you know you start hearing you, you kind of recalibrate your your center. Okay, now I'm in Iraq. What are the nearby countries? Iran, well, just after Iran is Afghanistan. Huh, I wonder what's going on over there. Uh, the U.S. is seriously engaged in this country. Um, at this time, we're, we're kind of drawing down in Iraq uh, one way or the other and uh, going for less engagement in, in Afghanistan uh, at about the same time, roughly. Um, all of a sudden, the, the U.S. and the West was kind of uh, all in on on trying to make uh, Afghanistan um, at, at least a more successful intervention, regardless of good or bad. It just uh, work harder to more effectively kind of influence the course of events in their favor. And Afghanistan was t just, you know, the most amazing experience. And and uh, uh, I ended up staying there for four years, um, became kind of deeply uh, embedded in. Uh, everything to do with Afghanistan, actually uh, had never fully felt comfortable, like most Arabic speakers, never felt fully comfortable, um, like most people who study Arabic, I should say, um, never felt fully comfortable in, in Arabic, um, just given the complexity of the language, and uh, ended up trading Afghanistan, um, Arabic more or less for uh, Afghan Farsi or Dari uh, and studied that uh, extensively and, and really fell into the place and tried to once and for all sink my teeth into a place with uh, extensive travel and uh, seeing as many of the 34 provinces I, as I could. I saw uh, more than half of them traveling all over, putting on local clothes and, and kind of hitting the road. Um, uh, whenever we could. Um, it was at this time that I started to get interested um, in writing and uh, research and, and language and kind of turning into uh, a research kind of guy, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better term. Um, and it was really a trip. I just put up this picture here. Um, it was a trip to a place, uh, a province called Gore. Um, and in Gore, there is a minaret uh, pictured here. It's called the Minaret of Jam. And it, you know, it always sounded like something out of a, an Indiana Jones film. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but uh, it was discovered in the 1950s by a British pilot who flew off course one day, um, uh, dry, uh, flying home from uh, India. And uh, it's just a fascinating place. Very little is, was is and was known about it, um, and uh, more interesting 
unfortunately still very few people had ever been there it's a very very difficult place to to get to um so this trip um was was kind of a uh big kind of door opener to um seeing okay you know let's really kind of take everything we've we've tried to learn and, and put it to the test and hit the road and get out there and have some unusual experiences um and and doing all this uh, meeting the people who live out there writing about it um and and just having kind of an adventure to boot i think uh while that was kind of on the tourism side of things there was also an interest in in trying to see uh, and this is what would kind of spark an idea that that led me to Turkey and work on the Syrian refugee crisis, a humanitarian crisis, was um, the idea of seeing policy uh, on the ground whenever possible. I mean, uh, in the United States, in the West, etc., we have tendencies to to just leave our policy discussion at a very macro level. You know, uh, we should support Group A or support Group B, or we should attack Location A or B, or not attack Location A or B. And um, you know, the the picture here is um, a picture I took in uh, Jalalabad in Afghanistan, and and what is pictured here is uh, Osama bin Laden's house that was hit by cruise missiles in uh, by the Clinton administration in the 90s, in the mid 90s, and I think standing there and kind of letting the um, the kind of aura wash over me, um, you you become kind of deeply aware that. Uh, the, these are not all kind of the faceless men and women of, of history and policy doesn't kind of just happen uh, automatically or by, um, you know, people uh, or like machines or nothing's automated. You know, these are real people with, with real lives. Um, and uh, to see that, okay, so this is what it's like to stand here and this is what it's like. This just really was the beginning of many experiences about, um, okay, so this is what it actually looks like when we attack uh, a place. This is what it looks like when we try to build a school um, in another location. This is what that looks like. And to just try and see policy uh, on the ground because on the ground it's uh, far different than uh, what we usually imagine uh, it looks like. Um, in uh, in practice, in theory, at least back in uh, Washington, where a lot of this stuff is designed, um, and yeah, as the next step, uh, this ultimately ended up. Uh, I put a book together. I was fortunate enough to to meet an amazing guy who's the founder of the American University of Afghanistan, a uh, true Afghan uh, intellectual, uh, who wrote his PhD thesis uh, that found the the missing link. Um, in poetry between uh, Walt Whitman and uh, Rumi, the uh, famed Persian, actually Afghan poet, um, and uh, had been an intellectual um, and born and raised in Afghanistan and then went to the United States um, for his master's and PhD degrees and then came back in 2001 as kind of this reluctant academic to try to rebuild um, higher education in Afghanistan. And uh, he worked as a government minister for four years and then uh, founded the American University of Afghanistan, um, really kind of on his own in a, <laughs> in a little rundown house uh, in a corner of Kabul um, before it became uh, an idea that uh, governments and other NGOs were interested in supporting. Um, so we put a, get a book together and this was also an amazing experience for me to kind of meet the people um, who are... Um, who are part of all of these um, policies that that uh, we build in um, in other countries, uh, or that we build in Washington and and employ in in other countries? Uh, this picture here is a picture of uh, my office in Turkey. Um, so in 2000, I was in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2014, uh, writing, researching, traveling, etc. And um, you know, I think there's a, a tendency for most folks to think that I know that what I must know is I must know Iraq really well or I must know Afghanistan really well. I know these places fairly well, but really what I what I learned, what I realized that I knew most about was um, kind of how the West uh, and the U.S. specifically tries to implement foreign policy as just being kind of a 
a near observer, not directly in it. I've never worked for any government, and uh, unlikely that I will. Um, and um, but just being one of these folks who were around um, these major attempts to to try to change societies or or influence the course of events in societies, I realized that what I would what I had actually had over the last five years from 2009 to 14 was uh, a front row seat to watching the West engage in countries and seeing uh, the people who were involved and the ideas that were involved and, and really the fundamentals and what does it actually mean when we support this group or do this thing or surge in this location or this and who, who are involved, who is involved, where are they involved, um, etc. And this led uh, myself and a group of uh, academics uh, and a few other researchers to found a research center in Turkey um, to look at the Syrian humanitarian uh, crisis because what became uh, what or at least the the theory was and what seemed seemed partially obvious to us was that um, the West maybe may have been heading down some of the same uh, roads that had not worked uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and was repeating the same kind of policy um, discussion. Uh, with Syria, usually this policy discussion is defined almost primarily by a lack of really knowing exactly what we're talking about with folks who do not speak the language of the places they're talking about. Um, and I don't mean to sound uh, super negative, but this is, I think, um, uh, a major issue that, that the West uh, has to deal with. It's a major kind of impediment to, to progress or success in, in, what, in the things the, the West tries to do. So we set up this little center. Uh, it's a very small place, the whole team fits around that that desk pictured there um, five or six uh, analysts and myself and uh, my my colleague uh, my co-director um, to try and uh, essentially evaluate aid impact and aid effectiveness because what we had seen in Iraq and Afghanistan was a lot of corruption a lot of waste a lot of uh, duplicative uh, aid a lot of aid that was unnecessary a lot of aid that wasn't even actually required uh, requested or asked for um, by folks and uh, this is a, a difficult and I think delicate thing to talk about because um, many folks um, you know via NGOs or governments etc assume that you know if you're trying to help and you're trying to do good that this is kind of good enough um, but actually what I saw and, and many others saw I'm not at all have no at all uh, kind of unique claim to this idea at all um, it's just that even even the humanitarian side of things can uh, have unexpected impacts and negative impacts uh, on the people that they are trying to help so we set this up to uh, essentially try to improve aid accountability uh, and uh, for the US taxpayers in particular but we also work with uh, quite a few UN uh, and European organizations and uh, we founded this in 2013 as we were uh, wrapping up our time uh, in Afghanistan. My colleague and I had been there for uh, what we thought was maybe too long. Uh, my colleague had actually been, my colleague Dan, uh, had been there for nine years in Afghanistan. I'd been there for three at this point. And we said, you know, uh, what's the hardest thing for us to do right now? And we said, uh, I think it's actually leave Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a place that can pull you in and, and uh, it gets very difficult to leave and I know that would probably come as a surprise to a lot of folks and I'm happy to explain that uh, in the Q&A. So we set up this as, as kind of the next thing that we would work on um, and now uh, provide kind of aid monitoring services to uh, the World Food Program, to State Department archaeologists, to uh, UN, other UN agencies, um, and about a dozen NGOs trying to help them uh, understand exactly what uh, is happening, what is needed, uh, and, and what the net impact of uh, the aid that they are sending into Syria is having um, on the populations, you know, to just give one, you know, anecdotal example. Um, you know, even organizations and NGOs that are just sending in blankets. So every every winter in in uh, southern Turkey, there's a discussion about uh, winter um, and how to help people survive the winter because it gets very cold, um, even in Syria. And up in the north in particular and um, you know even doing things such as sending blankets you know thousands of blankets 10,000 blankets you know if they're sent to the wrong place or the wrong militia intercepts them and takes them and sells them and buys more weapons with the sales that they just got from the blankets um, and conquers a neighboring village and these things have happened um, you know we start to see the impact of just doing something as simple as trying to send blankets to folks can have a, a very negative uh, effect on 
um, people's lives uh, on refugee lives. So uh, that is the idea of our center there. And then just because it comes up so often in conversation, <laughs> I'll end this with uh, a little bit uh, on Iran, which uh, up until uh, I was kind of detained for no reason whatsoever, uh, or detained baselessly, as, as other folks were saying, unjustly. Um, I was having a, an okay time there. Uh, so I first went to Iran in 2010 as a tourist. I'd been applying uh, very regularly uh, for a visa, and uh, much to my surprise, was granted one for a week in uh, 2010. So I went to Tehran and Esfahan and, and kicked around uh, just for a few days, really, a week, and uh, saw the place and, and really was, was quickly captivated, I think as most folks are um, by Iran you know we all know about the government and all that but the country itself is beautiful the people are, are, are pretty amazing and um, definitely knew it was a place I wanted to to get to know better um, and uh, really Afghanistan just next door where I was where I was then living at the time for for four years is kind of you know in the shadow of the Persian Empire they speak the same language just a dialect difference um, generally and um, so I'd always been interested in going back to Iran um, and spent five years applying for uh, a visa, which, um, you know, every month I would apply, every month I would get rejected, and I said, that's fine, you know, just resubmit my application and um, send it along. So uh, much to my surprise this past summer, I was uh, admitted uh, almost within a week of the nuclear deal. Uh, almost to the day of the nuclear deal within the same week. Uh, much to my surprise, got an email out of the blue from uh, Tehran, a center inside Tehran University, uh, which they like to say is their Harvard, um, for foreigners to come and study Farsi. So um, myself and only two or three other Americans had been admitted, and I jumped at the chance to go, uh, knowing full well this was a very kind of uh, unusual and odd time in Iranian-American relations uh, with a lot of folks seeing if things were going to change substantively from kind of the relationship that's uh, been defined by the last 30 years or so, uh, or if uh, things were going to stay the same. In any event, uh, got on the plane and, uh, yeah, spent three months uh, in Tehran studying Farsi, which was, uh, generally speaking, a fantastic time. Saw the sights, saw the people, met all lots of great people, so many great folks, um, and I uh, was generally having uh, a pretty good time. And in early December, my class uh, course finished. Uh, I took the final exam and did quite well, I'm proud to say. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, as I was headed to buy my uh, air airplane ticket home, um, uh, unfortunately was uh, kind of bagged or grabbed or whatever you want to say and, and driven to uh, even prison and uh, would end up spending about 40 days there. Um, uh, kind of on this uh, paranoid accusation that I was actually in Iran to to overthrow uh, the Iranian government, which uh, I, I mean I made the mistake of laughing when they told me that and thought you know that's that's absurd and where's the proof and all that and of course this didn't really have any bearing on on their thinking whatsoever so thus kicked off um, uh, 40 rather unpleasant days of uh, uh, them thinking. And not act, not genuinely thinking it, but just having an excuse to to kind of have um, a prisoner um, uh, or a hostage, and um, yeah, looking for anything that I'd done wrong, and of course couldn't find it. They had access to all my emails and all the text messages and everything. Uh, went through it all, and and despite their their best efforts, uh, really couldn't find much. Um, so uh, yeah, I got out, and on January 16th. And I uh, was thrilled to get out, and um, yeah, within uh, about five weeks or so, six weeks, uh, I spent a lot of time with my family, I made sure they were okay, it was an incredibly stressful time, obviously, for, for them, and of course, you always think about the mothers in a situation like that, so it worked very hard to uh, uh, let the family know that everything was okay now, and everything's fine, and um, yeah, just got back, well, then went back out to Turkey to continue the work we'd been doing with uh, Syrian refugees and just got back into Boston two days ago from uh, from Istanbul. So I think I've just done enough talking here at uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, and that kind of uh, does it for, for, uh, for my talk here. Um, so I'm happy to take questions if there are any questions or... Uh, yeah, anything like that.
Matt, thank you so much. We do have some questions. Sure. Um, so we'll jump right in. Uh, I should say that we are very glad that you're back and that you're okay too. <laughs> so, um, all right, we have a question from. Yes, <laughs> we have a question from Marina. Um, she asks, "What are some in-demand skills in the humanitarian research field currently, such as GIS mapping, data programs, etc., that may require additional study that you would recommend for um, building one's knowledge?" Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I can tell it's being asked by somebody who is uh, more than just a passing interest um, in this. Um, GIS mapping is definitely uh, in demand, um, and SPSS, um, knowledge of how to uh, use SPSS uh, to kind of collect uh, database and then analyze um, data. Those are those are two tools that I think would um, make you look. Uh, or make you a very desirable candidate for uh, uh, organizations in the humanitarian uh, field. Above all, though, I would say um, I think those two will help you no matter where uh, you're applying and then for, for whatever job at a humanitarian organization. That's what we look for uh, as well, and we've made a big switch to starting last year um, to include more mapping um, to use just kind of the industry lingo for a little bit, donors and, and clients alike are obsessed with um, more visuals and more data. Um, I have kind of mixed feelings about the ultimate usefulness of all of this. At some point, you're still relying on information that's collected from, um, you're still relying on information that has to be collected from folks and making sure that information itself is accurate versus, you know, the, the rush to just map it all and, and make pretty pictures out of it, um, I think has, has got to stay uh, on focus. But um, those two things are incredibly important. And then um, the last thing I would say is language ability. Um, we at our center, we hire, uh, we only hire folks who speak uh, advanced conversational Arabic, so reading, writing, um, and um, uh, obviously conversation. And you know, the idea there, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm kind of tooting my own horn here a little bit too much, but you know, we, we didn't realize that that would actually be a unique thing, I think, uh, in the humanitarian field. Um, uh, many organizations do not require language abilities at all, which I've never fully understood, I think. Um, and I think that also gives a nod to kind of the state of the humanitarian industry where people work in just for six months to a year in one place and six months to a year in the next place and go from, you know, Chad to Libya to Syria to Mexico to, you know, Mongolia and all over. Um, if it were up to me, I think folks would at least specialize on a region. So if you're specializing in a region, the most important thing you could do would be able to speak the language. Um, I really think uh, I really think that's very important. But yes, GIS mapping, SPSS, and then language ability. If you have those three things, you'll be a very in-demand uh, person no matter what, no matter where you're applying for. Great, thank you. Um, a, maybe a logistical question, but sure. um, how much of your work is, is done in that office that you showed us the picture of? And how much is spent, you know, getting out and meeting people and traveling? And also, how do you, how do you continue to manage all of the work that you're trying to do as you're going back and forth be between Boston and Turkey and other places? Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a it's a great question. Uh, I think the most important thing for for everything is being on the ground. Um, I come back to to the U.S. kind of once every six months, five months or so. That's at least been the trend. Uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, I come home once for Christmas and then once for kind of a summer break. Um, but I think extended periods of time on the ground are uh, absolutely invaluable to uh, really starting to sink your teeth into it. And I'm when I'm talking to folks, I'm really talking. I've realized as I've aged uh, just a little, I'm not the same age I was when I, as I went to the Middle East kind of seven years ago. Um, and um, But I think for, for anyone who's in their, their 20s to early 30s, I think spending uh, a good chunk of time, you know, years, um, at least two, uh, in a place is, is uh, required. Um, and, and also just helpful, I think, um, 
know, my biggest piece of advice to, to folks is actually to uh, I tell them to to play play the sponge card, like act like a sponge. You know, for the first six to eight months uh, you're in a place, I don't think you should really have any opinions. Uh, I think you should have minimal opinions on kind of what's going on um, around. And I think the most important thing you can do to kind of try to actually understand uh, the way the world works or as kind of George Orwell put it more memorably, you know, to see, <laughs> you know, the constant struggle to see what's exactly what's in front of one's nose. I think when you show up in a new place, spending six to eight months just taking taking the pulse of the place without much analysis is, is a really great move. Um, and yeah, logistical. Yeah, a lot of the <laughs> all our reports are written in that in that office around the table. Uh, we have a great little little house uh, in in southern Turkey uh, that we're fortunate to get, um, and, uh, and the rent's quite cheap, which is great. Um, and yeah, but otherwise, no, we're in daily contact with uh, a lot of folks in the field. You know, the situation in in Syria has changed quite a bit over the last three years. It's become um, it always has been from day one, very depressing uh, and extremely sad. Um, but um, it's also changed kind of for the danger levels um, for Syrians themselves living uh, in some of the locations inside uh, Syria. And, and I'm talking generally about opposition areas not under the government's control. Um, yeah, we spent an inordinate amount of time um, setting up uh, meeting the right people, and actually it took us uh, took us about two years to find the right guy that we were looking for uh, to be our field coordinator to to kind of manage um, our our relationships with folks we were um, uh, talking and working with uh, inside the country to make sure that aid was getting where where it was supposed to go. Um, and, uh, you know, we never would have found this guy if we hadn't spent, I, I think really it just comes down to pounding the pavement, um, in any industry, in any, um, whatever you're doing, you know, there's gotta be a part, a part of your, of your work, uh, as you're starting out in particular, that is, um, pounding the pavement. And so, yeah, we did exactly the same thing in terms of, uh, managing the workload as, as, uh, some of us are traveling. Um, <laughs> you know, we've been fortunate enough, uh, to take advantage of a lot of really cool tools that have come out of, uh, Silicon Valley. Um, you know, we don't use email for instance, uh, inside our team, which has been just a game changer. We use Slack, uh, you know, we use project management tools like Rike and Asana. Um, for things like that, and I think um, always making sure that you're studying um, about how to effectively uh, use your time. Um, there are some what it pays off enormous dividends because there are some incredible tools that allow you um, to to uh, to work more easily. You know, kind of from your phone and and from uh, a laptop with just an internet connection anywhere. That said, though, uh, with all that, with that that ease has a downside. I think a lot of people take that to mean they can just always kind of work from home or or work. And I even mean specifically in the humanitarian industry. You know, a lot of it is in in Turkey is even run out of Istanbul. They don't even want to be down near the near the border because you know we can just make phone calls and all that. Um, it, I think a combination of these these two things is the most important thing. Um, being there while working uh, efficiently. So you actually addressed one of the questions, which is that how do you find your, you know, your colleagues and your team, especially if there's a really particular skill set that's needed. Um, so you talked about that a little bit already, but um, the other question is why Turkey? Um, and yeah. then if you do have a chance to talk about what it is about Afghanistan that pulls you in, um, sure, that would be great. Um, yeah, finding the team, um, uh, you know, I think functioning as a startup is, is, you know, since, you know, starting your own, your own center, your own organization, you have to, it forces pragmatism. I think it forces, you can't be an ideologue and, and run a center. I mean, you can have a very distinct view of the way the world should work or should look like or whatever, um, but it forces you to make uh, effective, pragmatic decisions when you have extremely limited resources starting out, as did we. I mean, um, we, I, it's common misconception that, that we received any startup funding or grants from anybody uh, to start this. A lot of organizations are uh, started with uh, seed money from governments in particular and governmental relationships with uh, NGOs or non-governmental organizations. Uh, I've always been surprised just how deep those connections are. We have no institutional connections to anybody which allows us to kind of maintain a, a ruthless independence which um, I totally 
totally cherish. Uh, we don't really soften our words uh, in our reports about what we see and what we find. Uh, and I can say that that um, it's not always the case in the industry for that because a lot of folks are relying uh, on relationships uh, in this industry to to with donors to to keep um, funds flowing to ostensibly uh, help people. But um, yeah, that was the first. What was the first part of the question? Afghanistan was the second thing. <laughs> Turkey. Why Turkey? Yeah, why Turkey? Yeah. So uh, really, what what it came down to was uh, three years ago. Uh, when we started looking at this, um, at the Syrian conflict, you know, we just, we just took a little geographic look at uh, where is all the analysis on Syria coming from? And it was all coming out of Amman, Jordan, and, uh, or North Jordan, and uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And that kind of struck us as interesting. We ended up being one of the first firms established in Turkey. That was interesting to us. It made sense, of course, with the Arabic language connections, absolutely, but it didn't make sense from the angle that the vast and overwhelming number of refugees went to uh, north. They went north and went to Turkey, um, coming out of, of uh, the country. I mean, the city of Aleppo practically drained into uh, a Turkish city called Antakya and another Turkish city called Gaziantep. Uh, Raqqa moved into a Turkish city called Sanliorfa, Shanliorfa. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was, huh, this is an area where nobody's working and where um, uh, certainly the Turkish-Syrian border was an issue three years ago as it is now um, for all kinds of different reasons, but we didn't see, journalists were of course heading in um, and and uh, kind of hardcore researchers were as well um, uh, to, to try and understand and parse together what was happening, but we didn't see, nobody was setting up shop kind of in, in Turkey um, and it just seemed that um, the institutions, the analysis that was coming out of uh, the refugee and humanitarian situation on on um, on Turk on Syria was, excuse me, all coming out of uh, the same places, the same organizations in the same locations. So we saw a little bit, you know, we're we're a little snarky, we're a little sassy, and we're kind of a little independent uh, thing founded by a bunch of group, uh, founded by a group of guys and girls who are who are extremely jaded, um, and it's very easy to be extremely jaded. So we try and take that into consideration as well. But yeah, it was really Turkey um, because no one else was there. Um, and uh, nobody was setting up shop. Again, it's very easy to visit these places. You'll see uh, to this day, um, and it's, uh, I don't want to make every question about everything, but <laughs> all of the stuff is connected. Um, to this day, you see uh, a lot of the analysis that particularly it's published in the United States and even in Europe on uh, Syria are published by folks when you look you know at the bottom of the foreign affairs article or whatever who you know went on a five day fact finding mission I've worked with some of these folks you know five day fact finding mission to, to Turkey or ten day fact finding mission I mean I, you know you just kind of laugh and, and this is what is used as kind of oh well you know Dr. So-and-so just returned from a fact finding mission to Turkey to discuss this but they were only there for a few days when you look in the fine print I mean, what can you understand about a place in a few days you need to I mean a few years ideally or at least a few months um, and and uh, that's kind of why we decided to, to set up shop there and as for Afghanistan I mean Afghanistan uh, I, I find myself tempted to say is for anyone who's been there um, and I guess not everybody does get on the plane to Afghanistan but I, I really think everybody should go at some point um, um, maybe when the security situation is a little more tolerable or palatable, but even even so. Um, Afghanistan is an unbelievable place. It's hands down my favorite country I've ever been. Uh, a lot of people are, are obsessed with Iran. Uh, Iran didn't do it for me. Afghanistan does it for me. Um, it's utterly captivating. Um, and it's not just the romantic end. I think, you know, in, in philosophy, you have the kind of like romanticism with a capital R, romantic thought about um, kind of an emotional attachment to a place. You definitely have that in Afghanistan. It happens very quickly. Uh, the people are incredible, somehow still smiling and, and in, uh, just the warmest and most hospitable folks uh, you'll ever meet. Um, and that's just particularly astonishing given that you know, one in five Afghans was killed or injured just during the Ro Russian uh, or the Soviet Union um, war there alone, let alone everything that's happened since. Um, and uh, so that's just astonishing. And, but, uh, you know, from the other end of things, you also see um, 
you know, if there's one struggle in in all of the travels from anywhere I've gone, and I don't want to make it sound there are plenty of people who've been to far more places than I have, but if there's one struggle from from any anywhere I've been, it's to just try to see the world just even for a moment, uh, glimpse the the fundamental nature of how the world works uh, in practice, kind of devoid of ideology or theory or you know I'm a sociologist therefore I think this no 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 to just kind of stripped of all pretense see the world for the way it fundamentally functions um, and relationships between people um, both positive and negative and and war and what does war look like and what is uh, love and what does love look like in poetry and <clears throat> um, you find all of that the closest I've ever come to seeing it I think is is in Afghanistan um, and I only left Afghanistan because I myself became uh, kind of inspired by a theory of um, of you always have to kind of take the hardest decision. You know, what is the hardest thing I can do right now? And what I'd started to realize over time was that the hardest decision for me to make would be to leave Afghanistan. And that's why I left was because um, I realized I probably could have stayed there for far longer, definitely a few more years at a minimum. So uh, yeah, Afghanistan, it's an amazing place. It's amazing if you talk to your older generation, kind of uh, like my, my age uh, would be our grandparents or our parents' generation. Uh, talk to them, people who went to Afghanistan in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. You'll you'll hear them. Uh, you know, I've I've witnessed it many times. People who who kind of lean back, take off their glasses. You know, if they're sitting at a desk and just say, "Oh, you know, that was that was an amazing time." And and a lot of them went. Uh, <laughs> they went and after even friends of mine who work on Wall Street, they they their bosses. You know, they they went to Harvard Business School and then went to Afghanistan and smoked opium for three months in the Hindu Kush and just kind of fell off the grid. You know, they saw they saw the same thing. Um, I'm not saying I did that at all. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you see the, that same appeal going then and straightforward through to, to today of just getting kind of uh, captivated by an intoxicating country. And uh, despite everything that is happening in that place, I mean, even just the news today and yesterday about kind of Al-Qaeda resurgent in the country, which is just so incredibly depressing for so many folks and myself very much included in Part of that is somebody who's kind of spent four years their their prime in there, uh, hoping to see kind of better things emerge. Um, it pulls you in, uh, and there's just no denying the, the power. Okay, I'm talking too much about this, but yeah, it pulls you <laughs> in. That's the answer. <laughs> Matt, you're gonna you're inspiring all of us to travel, and I think to uh, make an impact, because <laughs> we have a question from Melissa. What is the number one area in which you think science and technology can make the biggest immediate impact? in this arena that you've been talking about, the, the refugees and the humanitarian crises? <clears throat> That's a great question. Wow, there's some great people listening to this. Uh, yes. This is, uh, this is wow, and I'm uh, flattered that some folks think I might have the answer. You know, I just, I just have my opinions. Uh, science and technology and how the impact that can have on, on helping uh, refugees, I think, I think rather belatedly uh, in the humanitarian field, folks are coming to realize um, the power of kind of accurate data collection. And I think that's where science and technology can play an inordinate um, role for good, is to effectively map the needs of a specific population. And, uh, you know, to give a very specific example, the iPhone's been out since 2007. Um, and you know, even given the, the pace at which kind of large global organizations move, however, um, people have been very slow to adopt digital data collection. Um, and particularly uh, in places like Syria, I mean, we only, for instance, we only use uh, digital data collection tools. We use a, a custom kind of variation of something called ODK, um, and which we've tweaked a little bit to for our needs in, in Syria uh, and in, along the border in Turkey. Um, um, but a lot of people uh, to this day, there are still folks using pen and paper. Um, and I think uh, that's a huge issue. Um, so I think using more accurate data collection tools um, 
yeah, th this this kind of answer has two parts. One, the pro part, and one, the, the kind of con. Um, one, I think we can use uh, things like satellites um, and uh, better understanding of weather patterns, et cetera, to make life a lot better for a lot of people. I think that's in incredibly useful. I think using um, the mobile phone in particular, um, anybody who's listening to this would be extremely familiar with um, uh, you know, it's just a revolutionary, revolutionary impact uh, of the mobile phone in, in areas. Um, uh, my focus is on, on the Middle East, but also, of course, in Africa and in South America, um, that rural communities, the impact, the incredibly positive impact uh, that can be had with mobile phones via for banking or the transfer of money or increasing transparency among corrupt institutions, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's an incredible thing. Uh, with that, I do want to caution um, you know, there there is a bit of a tech evangelism, I think, um, not least in Silicon Valley, of course, where you would expect to find it, but um, uh, there's also a race to, and I, I think I kind of hinted at this with the GIS mapping question, there's um, there's also with this a kind of sense of, oh, well, you know, we can just, uh, if we just look at it using this data collection tool, or if we just redo all the data, like coding it this way, um, you know, we can kind of get more information out of it. And at the end of the day, this is where I think that classic, classic phrase on statistics emerges of, you know, torturing the data until it confesses. Um, I think the only danger with all of these new incredible tools is the tendency to um, continually uh, reanalyze and regress uh, data uh, is almost too too tempting to to pass up on. Um, and I definitely have seen some organizations that we work with are just kind of obsessed with these really powerful infographics and powerful um, uh, you know charts and things like that. And that's all great, but it just you know it it. it you have to remember at the end of the day, and this is where I think always an inherent skepticism, um, I think an appropriate skepticism, it's easy, like I said, to go far too far um, and just be skeptical that nothing works and you know, we're all going to die and the world's a dark place and that's that. No, we don't need to go that far. But um, I think just remembering that you're collecting data under extreme circumstances and never to rely on any data and, I, and this even puts me at an uncomfortable point with some of the people I work with. I say, you know, even our own reports, which I'll stand by forever, you know, to, out to the, you know, thousandth decimal point on in terms of veracity, um, you know, I, I tell them, I'm the first to tell them, only take this as a ballpark indicator. You know, at the end of the day, we're collecting data from, um, you know, populations that have been traumatized uh, or we're collecting them in an area where there's ongoing shelling where there are airstrikes ongoing we work in some of these areas you know so yeah I, I get that all of your charts and all your fancy you know tools all say this and that's great and it's incredible um, but at the same time you know just remember take it all with a grain of salt um, whenever you're working in I mean that's the great quote about you know, humanity, humans, and, and kind of economics, at the end of the day, you always have to remember that you're dealing with human subjects, and humans are fickle, and we don't always make choices according to simple kind of linear or causal relationships. You have to um, kind of encapsulate the whole thing. So the only danger is a very long way of saying um, in the rush to up science and technology in terms of human, in the humanitarian field, which I think is overall, overall an incredibly useful and important thing, uh, we just need to bear in mind um, the that uh, it doesn't tell us everything, and particularly when we're talking about people, um, you can only quantify things so much. Thank you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, um, so if anyone has one more question, please type it into that box very quickly so we can get to it. Um, Matt, if people want to sort of stay up to date on what you're doing or um, what's going on. Is there a good way for them to do that? And also, do you have any plans to um, publish anything or put out any resources for those of us who want to keep, keep learning? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm resisting the urge to write a book uh, about Iran. You'd be amazed how many folks are saying, oh, you know, when's a book and movie coming out? Well, there's no book and there's no movie coming out. We're, we're not doing any of that. Nobody was interested in a movie. I want to be very clear. Um, but we're also <laughs> not going not gonna, to not gonna write a book, uh, at least specifically, uh, about Iran. Um, that was just an unfortunate experience. And, you know, uh, as far as unfortunate experiences go in the Middle East, uh, that was a pretty good one honestly on the whole so um, uh, you know I'm the first person to kind of say 
yeah, it wasn't a pleasant time, uh, particularly solitary confinement for a month, but uh, otherwise, um, you know, uh, it could have been much worse. And, you know, the lives, the lives of, you know, these Syrian refugees that I work with on a daily basis are much, much worse. So um, I'd have to be a bit self-centered to think that this kind of changes everything for me. Um, but yeah, honestly, I'd be happy to stay in touch with anybody who's interested uh, by email. Uh, happy to type in my email or say it here. It's my last name, Trevithic, um, at eml.cc. It's a little bit of an unusual domain, but um, yeah, uh, I kind of work on, on email um, for anybody. I'm on Twitter occasionally, um, but uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions or share uh, anything via email. I have a website, it's matttrevithic.com, that's occasionally updated. Um, but yeah, probably the way it can be most helpful to folks is um, um, by email. Great, thank you. Um, so I, if there aren't any other questions, then I think we'll probably wrap up because I know people um, have taken an hour out of their day to join us, which we're really glad about. And um, we actually do have a, a webinar scheduled for next month, um, an educational webinar with an update from one of our doctors over at the School of Public Health about the Zika virus. So if any of you are also interested in that, um, it'll be on May 12th, and you can look for information on that. Um, Matt, is there anything else you want to tell everyone before we let them go? No, no, this is it. Thank you so much for, for listening. Uh, I hope it was interesting. Uh, definitely send me an email if there's anything I can do for the BU. Uh, you know, nothing nothing but the best for, for the BU alumni community. So anything I can do to be of service to, to anybody, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And then uh, for anybody who's uh, still wondering uh, if there are people listening who are kind of curious about, about getting out there or, or going into the world, yeah, my, own, my biggest piece of advice is to just get on the plane. Um, it's complicated until it's not, and ultimately you just got to get on the plane. So that's it. <laughs> or the bus, or the train, or wherever you're going. Just go for it. Great advice. Get on the plane. <laughs> Let's all go. <laughs> and, and everyone is also welcome to contact the BU Alumni Association anytime. We are always happy to hear from you guys. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.